how this book was written, and why. In 1909, I was one of the unhappiest lads in New York. I was selling motor trucks for a living. I didn't know what made a motor truck run, and that wasn't all. I didn't want to know. I despised my job. I despised living in a cheap furnished room on West 56th Street, a room infested with cockroaches. I still remember that I had a bunch of neckties hanging on the walls, and when I reached out of a morning to get a fresh necktie, the cockroaches scattered in all directions. I despised having to eat in cheap, dirty restaurants that were also probably infested with cockroaches. I came home to my lonely room each night with a sick headache, a headache bred and fed by disappointment, worry, bitterness, and rebellion. I was rebelling because the dreams I had nourished back in my college days had turned into nightmares. Was this life? Was this the vital adventure to which I had looked forward so eagerly? Was this all life would ever mean to me, working at a job I despised, living with cockroaches, eating vile food, and with no hope for the future? I longed for the leisure to read and to write the books I had dreamed of writing back in my college days. I knew I had everything to gain and nothing to lose by giving up the job I despised. I wasn't interested in making a lot of money, but I was interested in making a lot of living. In short, I had come to the Rubicon, to that moment of decision which faces most young people when they start out in life. So I made my decision, and that decision completely altered my future. It has made the rest of my life happy and rewarding beyond my most utopian aspirations. My decision was this. I would give up the work I loathed, and since I had spent four years studying in the State Teachers College in Warrensburg, Missouri, preparing to teach, I would make my living teaching adult classes in night schools. Then I'd have my days free to read books, prepare lectures, write novels and short stories. I wanted to live to write and write to live. What subject should I teach to adults at night? As I looked back and evaluated my own college training, I saw that the training and experience I had had in public speaking had been of more practical value to me in business and in life than everything else I had studied in college all put together. Why? Because it had wiped out my timidity and lack of self-confidence and given me the courage and assurance to deal with people. It had also made clear that leadership usually gravitates to the man who can get up and say what he thinks. I applied for a position teaching public speaking in the night extension courses both at Columbia University and New York University, but these universities decided they could struggle along somehow without my help. I was disappointed then, but now I thank God that they did turn me down because I started teaching at YMCA night schools where I had to show concrete results and show them quickly. What a challenge that was. These adults didn't come to my classes because they wanted college credits or social prestige. They came for one reason only. They wanted to solve their problems. They wanted to be able to stand up on their feet and say a few words at a business meeting without fainting from fright. Salesmen wanted to be able to call on a tough customer without having to walk around the block three times to get up courage. They wanted to develop poise and self-confidence. They wanted to get ahead in business. They wanted to have more money for their families. And since they were paying for their tuition on an installment basis, and they stopped paying if they didn't get results, and since I was being paid not a salary but a percentage of the profits, I had to be practical if I wanted to eat. I felt at the time that I was teaching under a handicap, but I realize now that I was getting priceless training. I had to motivate my students. I had to help them solve their problems. I had to make each session so inspiring that they wanted to continue coming. It was exciting work. I loved it. I was astounded at how quickly these businessmen developed self-confidence and how quickly many of them secured promotions and increased pay. The classes were succeeding far beyond my most optimistic hopes. Within three seasons, the YMCA's, which had refused to pay me $5 a night in salary, were paying me $30 a night on a percentage basis. 
At first, I taught only public speaking, but as the years went by, I saw that these adults also needed the ability to win friends and influence people. Since I couldn't find an adequate textbook on human relations, I wrote one myself. It was written, uh, no, it wasn't written in the usual way. It grew and evolved out of the experiences of the adults in these classes. I called it How to Win Friends and Influence People. Since it was written solely as a textbook for my own adult classes, and since I had written four other books that no one had ever heard of, I never dreamed that it would have a large sale. I am probably one of the most astonished authors now living. As the years went by, I realized that another of the biggest problems of these adults was worry. A large majority of my students were businessmen, executives, salesmen, engineers, accountants, a cross-section of all the trades and professions, and most of them had problems. There were women in the classes, businesswomen and housewives. They, too, had problems. Clearly, what I needed was a textbook on how to conquer worry, so again, I tried to find one. I went to New York's great public library at 5th Avenue and 42nd Street and discovered, to my astonishment, that this library had only 22 books listed under the title Worry. I also noticed, to my amusement, that it had 189 books listed under Worms, almost nine times as many books about worms as about worry. Astounding, isn't it? Since worry is one of the biggest problems facing mankind, you'd think, wouldn't you, that every high school and college in the land would give a course on how to stop worrying. Yet if there is even one course on that subject in any college in the land, I have never heard of it. No wonder David Seabury said in his book, How to Worry Successfully, we come to maturity with as little preparation for the pressures of experience as a bookworm asked to do a ballet. The result? More than half our hospital beds are occupied by people with nervous and emotional troubles. I looked over these 22 books on worry reposing on the shelves of the New York Public Library. In addition, I purchased all the books on worry I could find, yet I couldn't discover even one that I could use as a text in my course for adults. So I resolved to write one myself. I began preparing myself to write this book seven years ago. How? By reading what the philosophers of all ages have said about worry. I also read hundreds of biographies, all the way from Confucius to Churchill. I also interviewed scores of prominent people in many walks of life, such as Jack Dempsey, General Omar Bradley, General Mark Clark, Henry Ford, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Dorothy Dix. But that was only a beginning. I also did something else that was far more important than the interviews and the reading. I worked for five years in a laboratory for conquering worry, a laboratory conducted in our own adult classes. As far as I know, it was the first and only laboratory of its kind in the world. This is what we did. We gave students a set of rules on how to stop worrying and asked them to apply these rules in their own lives and then talk to the class on the results they had obtained. Others reported on techniques they'd used in the past. As a result of this experience, I presume I have listened to more talks on how I conquered worry than has any other individual who ever walked this earth. In addition, I read hundreds of other talks on how I conquered worry, talks that were sent to me by mail, talks that had won prizes in our classes that are held throughout the world. So this book didn't come out of an ivory tower. Neither is it an academic preachment on how worry might be conquered. Instead, I've tried to write a fast-moving, concise, documented report on how worry has been conquered by thousands of adults. One thing is certain, this book is practical. You can set your teeth in it. Science, said the French philosopher Valérie, is a collection of successful recipes. That's what this book is, a collection of successful and time-tested recipes to rid our lives of worry. However, let me warn you, you won't find anything new in it, but you will find much that's not generally applied. And when it comes to that, you and I don't need to be told anything new. We already know enough to lead perfect lives. We've all read the Golden Rule and the Sermon on the Mount. Our trouble is not ignorance, but inaction. 
The purpose of this book is to restate, illustrate, streamline, air condition, and glorify a lot of ancient and basic truths and kick you in the shins and make you do something about applying them. You didn't pick up this book to read about how it was written. You're looking for action. All right, let's go. Please read parts one and two of this book, and then if by that time you don't feel you've acquired a new power and a new inspiration to stop worry and enjoy life, then toss this book away. It is no good for you. How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie Part one, Fundamental Facts You Should Know About Worry Chapter one, Live in day-tight compartments. In the spring of 1871, a young man picked up a book and read 21 words that had a profound effect on his future. A medical student at the Montreal General Hospital, he was worried about passing the final examination, worried about what to do, where to go, how to build up a practice, how to make a living. The 21 words that this young medical student read in 1871 helped him to become the most famous physician of his generation. He organized the world-famous Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He became Regius Professor of Medicine at Oxford, the highest honor that can be bestowed upon any medical man in the British Empire. He was knighted by the King of England. When he died, two huge volumes containing 1,466 pages were required to tell the story of his life. His name was Sir William Osler. Here are the 21 words that he read in the spring of 1871, 21 words from Thomas Carlyle that helped him lead a life free from worry. Our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Forty-two years later, on a soft spring night when the tulips were blooming on the campus, this man, Sir William Osler, addressed the students of Yale University. He told those Yale students that a man like himself, who had been a professor in four universities and had written a popular book, was supposed to have brains of a special quality. He declared that this was untrue. He said that his intimate friends knew that his brains were of the most mediocre character. What then was the secret of his success? He stated that it was owing to what he called living in day-tight compartments. What did he mean by that? A few months before he spoke at Yale, Sir William Osler had crossed the Atlantic on a great ocean liner, where the captain, standing on the bridge, could press a button, and presto, there was a clanging of machinery, and various parts of the ship were immediately shut off from one another, shut off into watertight compartments. Now, each one of you, Dr. Osler said to these Yale students, is a much more marvelous organization than the great liner, and bound on a longer voyage. What I urge is that you so learn to control the machinery as to live with day-tight compartments as the most certain way to ensure safety on the voyage. Get on the bridge and see that at least the great bulkheads are in working order. Touch a button and hear at every level of your life the iron doors shutting out the past, the dread yesterdays. Touch another and shut off with a metal curtain the future, the unborn tomorrows. Then you are safe, safe for today. Shut off the past. Let the dead past bury its dead. Shut out the yesterdays which have lighted fools the way to dusty death. The load of tomorrow added to that of yesterday, carried today, makes the strongest falter. Shut off the future as tightly as the past. The future is today. There is no tomorrow. The day of man's salvation is now. Waste of energy, Mental distress, nervous worries dog the steps of a man who is anxious about the future. Shut close, then, the great fore and aft bulkheads and prepare to cultivate the habit of a life of day-tight compartments. Did Dr. Osler mean to say that we should not make any effort to prepare for tomorrow? No, not at all. But he did go on in that address to say that the best possible way to prepare for tomorrow is to concentrate with all your intelligence, all your enthusiasm, on doing today's work superbly today.
That's the only possible way you can prepare for the future. Sir William Osler urged the students at Yale to begin the day with Christ's prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Remember that the prayer asks only for today's bread. It doesn't complain about the stale bread we had to eat yesterday, and it doesn't say, oh God, it has been pretty dry out in the wheat belts lately and we may have another drought and then how will I get my bread to eat next fall? Or suppose I lose my job, oh God, how could I get bread then? No, this prayer teaches us to ask for today's bread only. Today's bread is the only kind of bread you can possibly eat. Years ago, a penniless philosopher was wandering through stony country where the people had a hard time making a living. One day, a crowd gathered about him on a hill, and he gave what is probably the most quoted speech ever delivered anywhere at any time. This speech contains 26 words that have gone ringing down across the centuries. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Many men have rejected those words of Jesus, take no thought for the morrow. They have rejected those words as a counsel of perfection, as a bit of mysticism. I must take thought for the morrow, they say. I must take out insurance to protect my family. I must lay aside money for my old age. I must plan and prepare to get ahead. Right, of course you must. The truth is that those words of Jesus, translated over 300 years ago, don't mean today what they meant during the reign of King James. 300 years ago, the word thought frequently meant anxiety. Modern versions of the Bible quote Jesus more accurately as saying, have no anxiety for the tomorrow. By all means, take thought for tomorrow, yes, careful thought and planning and preparation, but have no anxiety. During the Second World War, our military leaders planned for the morrow, but they could not afford to have any anxiety. I have supplied the best men with the best equipment we have, said Admiral Ernest J. King, who directed the United States Navy, and have given them what seems to be the wisest mission. That is all I can do. Whether in war or peace, good thinking deals with causes and effects and leads to logical, constructive planning. Bad thinking frequently leads to tension and nervous breakdown. I had the privilege of interviewing Arthur Hayes Salzberger, publisher from 1935 to 1961 of one of the most famous newspapers in the world, the New York Times. Mr. Salzberger told me that when the Second World War flamed across Europe, he was so stunned, so worried about the future, that he found it almost impossible to sleep. He would frequently get out of bed in the middle of the night, take some canvas and tubes of paint, look in the mirror, and try to paint a portrait of himself. He didn't know anything about painting, but he painted anyway, to get his mind off his worries. Mr. Salzberger told me that he was never able to banish his worries and find peace until he had adopted as his motto five words from a church hymn, One Step Enough for Me. Lead kindly light, keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene, one step enough for me. At about the same time, a young man in uniform somewhere in Europe was learning the same lesson. His name was Ted Benjamino of Baltimore, Maryland, and he had worried himself into a first-class case of combat fatigue. In April 1945, wrote Ted Benjamino, I had worried until I had developed what doctors called a spasmodic transverse colon, a condition that produced intense pain. If the war hadn't ended when it did, I'm sure I would have had a complete physical breakdown. I was utterly exhausted. I was a Graves Registration non-commissioned officer for the 94th Infantry Division. My work was to help set up and maintain records of all men killed in action, missing in action, and hospitalized. I also had to help disinter the bodies of both Allied and enemy soldiers who had been killed and hastily buried in shallow graves during the pitch of battle. I had to gather up the personal effects of these men and see that they were sent back to parents or closest relatives who would prize these personal effects so much. 
I was constantly worried for fear we might be making embarrassing and serious mistakes. I was worried about whether or not I would come through all this. I was worried about whether I would live to hold my only child in my arms, a son of 16 months whom I had never seen. I was so worried and exhausted that I lost 34 pounds. I was so frantic that I was almost out of my mind. I looked at my hands. They were hardly more than skin and bones. I was terrified at the thought of going home a physical wreck. I broke down and sobbed like a child. I was so shaken that tears welled up every time I was alone. There was one period soon after the Battle of the Bulge started that I wept so often that I almost gave up hope of ever being a normal human being again. I ended up in an army dispensary. An army doctor gave me some advice, which has completely changed my life. After giving me a thorough physical examination, he informed me that my troubles were mental. Ted, he said, I want you to think of your life as an hourglass. You know there are thousands of grains of sand in the top of the hourglass, and they all pass slowly and evenly through the narrow neck in the middle. Nothing you or I could do would make more than one grain of sand pass through this narrow neck without impairing the hourglass. You and I and everyone else are like this hourglass. When we start in the morning, there are hundreds of tasks which we feel that we must accomplish that day. But if we do not take them one at a time and let them pass through the day slowly and evenly, as do the grains of sand passing through the narrow neck of the hourglass, then we're bound to break our own physical or mental structure. I've practiced that philosophy ever since that memorable day that an army doctor gave it to me. One grain of sand at a time, one task at a time. That advice saved me physically and mentally during the war and it has also helped me in my present position as public relations and advertising director for the Ad Crafters Printing and Offset Company, Incorporated. I found the same problem arising in business that had arisen during the war. A score of things had to be done at once, and there was little time to do them. We were low in stocks. We had new forms to handle, new stock arrangements, changes of address, opening and closing offices, and so on. Instead of getting taut and nervous, I remembered what the doctor had told me, one grain of sand at a time, one task at a time. By repeating those words to myself over and over, I accomplished my tasks in a more efficient manner, and I did my work without the confused, jumbled feeling that had almost wrecked me on the battlefield. One of the most appalling comments on our present way of life is that at one time, Half of all the beds in our hospitals were reserved for patients with nervous and mental troubles, patients who had collapsed under the crushing burden of accumulated yesterdays and fearful tomorrows. Yet a vast majority of those people could have avoided those hospitals, could have led happy, useful lives if they had only heeded the words of Jesus, have no anxiety about the morrow, or the words of Sir William Osler, live in day-tight compartments. You and I are standing this very second at the meeting place of two eternities, the vast past that has endured forever and the future that is plunging on to the last syllable of recorded time. We can't possibly live in either of those eternities, no, not even for one split second. But by trying to do so, we can wreck both our bodies and our minds. So let's be content to live the only time we can possibly live, from now until bedtime. Anyone can carry his burden, however hard, until nightfall, wrote Robert Louis Stevenson. Anyone can do his work, however hard, for one day. Anyone can live sweetly, patiently, lovingly, purely, till the sun goes down. And this is all that life really means. Yes, that is all that life requires of us. But Mrs. E. K. Shields of Saginaw, Michigan, was driven to despair, even to the brink of suicide, before she learned to live just till bedtime. In 1937, I lost my husband, Mrs. Shields said, as she told me her story. I was very depressed and almost penniless. I wrote my former employer, Mr. Leon Roach of the Roach Fowler Company of Kansas City, and got my old job back. 
I had formerly made my living selling world books to rural and town school boards. I had sold my car two years previously when my husband became ill, but I managed to scrape together enough money to put a down payment on a used car and started out to sell books again. I had thought that getting back on the road would help relieve my depression, but driving alone and eating alone was almost more than I could take. Some of the territory was not very productive, and I found it hard to make those car payments, small as they were. In the spring of 1938, I was working out of Versailles, Missouri. The schools were poor, the roads bad, and I was so lonely and discouraged that at one time I even considered suicide. It seemed that success was impossible. I had nothing to live for. I dreaded getting up each morning and facing life. I was afraid of everything, afraid I could not meet the car payments, afraid I could not pay my room rent, afraid I would not have enough to eat. I was afraid my health was failing and I had no money for a doctor. All that kept me from suicide were the thoughts that my sister would be deeply grieved and that I didn't have enough money to pay my funeral expenses. Then one day, I read an article that lifted me out of my despondence and gave me the courage to go on living. I shall never cease to be grateful for one inspiring sentence in that article. It said, Every day is a new life to a wise man. I typed that sentence out and pasted it on the windshield of my car, where I saw it every minute I was driving. I found it wasn't so hard to live only one day at a time. I learned to forget the yesterdays and not to think of the tomorrows. Each morning I said to myself, today is a new life. I have succeeded in overcoming my fear of loneliness, my fear of want. I am happy and fairly successful now and have a lot of enthusiasm and love for life. I know now that I shall never again be afraid, regardless of what life hands me. I know now that I won't have to fear the future. I know now that I can live one day at a time, and that every day is a new life to a wise man. Who do you suppose wrote this verse? Happy the man, and happy he alone, he who can call today his own, he who, secure within, can say, Tomorrow do thy worst for I have lived today. Those words sound modern, don't they? Yet they were written 30 years before Christ was born by the Roman poet Horace. One of the most tragic things I know about human nature is that all of us tend to put off living. We're all dreaming of some magical rose garden over the horizon instead of enjoying the roses that are blooming outside our windows today. Why are we such fools, such tragic fools? How strange it is, our little procession of life, wrote Stephen Leacock. The child says, when I am a big boy, but what is that? The big boy says, when I grow up, and then grown up, he says, when I get married, but to be married, what is that after all? The thought changes to when I'm able to retire, and then, when retirement comes, he looks back over the landscape traversed. A cold wind seems to sweep over it. Somehow he has missed it all, and it is gone. Life, we learn too late, is in the living, in the tissue of every day and hour. The late Edward S. Evans of Detroit almost killed himself with worry before he learned that life is in the living, in the tissue of every day and hour. Brought up in poverty, Edward Evans made his first money by selling newspapers, then worked as a grocer's clerk. Later, with seven people dependent upon him for bread and butter, he got a job as an assistant librarian. Small as the pay was, he was afraid to quit. Eight years passed before he could summon up the courage to start out on his own. But once he started, he built up an original investment of 55 borrowed dollars into a business of his own that made him $20,000 a year. Then came a frost, a killing frost. He endorsed a big note for a friend, and the friend went bankrupt. Quickly on top of that disaster came another. The bank in which he had all his money collapsed. He not only lost every cent he had, but was plunged into debt for $16,000. His nerves couldn't take it. I couldn't sleep or eat, he told me. I became strangely ill. 
Worry, and nothing but worry, he said, brought on this illness. One day, as I was walking down the street, I fainted and fell on the sidewalk. I was no longer able to walk. I was put to bed, and my body broke out in boils. These boils turned inward until just lying in bed was agony. I grew weaker every day. Finally, my doctor told me that I had only two more weeks to live. I was shocked. I drew up my will, and then lay back in bed to await my end. No use to struggle now or worry. I gave up, relaxed, and went to sleep. I hadn't slept two hours in succession for weeks, but now, with my earthly problems drawing to an end, I slept like a baby. My exhausting weariness began to disappear. My appetite returned. I gained weight. A few weeks later, I was able to walk with crutches. Six weeks later, I was able to go back to work. I'd been making $20,000 a year, but I was glad now to get a job for $30 a week. I got a job selling blocks to put behind the wheels of automobiles when they're shipped by freight. I'd learned my lesson now. No more worry for me, no more regret about what had happened in the past, no more dread of the future. I concentrated all my time, energy, and enthusiasm into selling those blocks. Edward S. Evans shot up fast now. In a few years, he was president of the company, the Evans Products Company. It's been listed on the New York Stock Exchange for years. If you ever fly over Greenland, you may land on Evans Field, a flying field named in his honor. Yet Edward S. Evans never would have achieved these victories if he hadn't learned to live in daytight compartments. You'll recall that the White Queen said, the rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. Most of us are like that, stewing about yesterday's jam and worrying about tomorrow's jam instead of spreading today's jam thick on our bread right now. Even the great French philosopher Montaigne made that mistake. My life, he said, has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. So has mine. So has yours. Think, said Dante, that this day will never dawn again. Life is slipping away with incredible speed. We're racing through space at a rate of 19 miles every second. Today is our most precious possession. It is our only sure possession. That's the philosophy of Lowell Thomas. I recently spent a weekend at his farm and noticed that he had these words from Psalm 118 framed and hanging on the wall of his broadcasting studio, where he would see them often. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The writer John Ruskin had on his desk a simple piece of stone on which was carved one word, today. And while I haven't a piece of stone on my desk, I do have a poem pasted on my mirror where I can see it when I shave every morning, a poem that Sir William Osler always kept on his desk, a poem written by the famous Indian dramatist Kalidasa. Salutation to the Dawn. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation to the dawn. So the first thing you should know about worry is this. If you want to keep it out of your life, do what Sir William Osler did. One, shut the iron doors on the past and the future. Live in daytight compartments. Why not ask yourself these questions and write down the answers? One, do I tend to put off living in the present in order to worry about the future or to yearn for some magical rose garden over the horizon? Two, do I sometimes embitter the present by regretting things that happened in the past that are over and done with? Three, do I get up in the morning determined to seize the day to get the utmost out of these 24 hours? Four, 
Can I get more out of life by living in day-tight compartments? 5. When shall I start to do this? Next week? Tomorrow? Today? Chapter 2. A Magic Formula for Solving Worry Situations would you like a quick, surefire recipe for handling worry situations? A technique you can start using right away, before you go any further in reading this book. Then let me tell you about the method worked out by Willis H. Carrier, the brilliant engineer who launched the air conditioning industry and who headed the world-famous Carrier Corporation in Syracuse, New York. It's one of the best techniques I ever heard of for solving worry problems, and I got it from Mr. Carrier personally when we were having lunch together one day at the Engineers Club in New York. When I was a young man, Mr. Carrier said, I worked for the Buffalo Forge Company in Buffalo, New York. I was handed the assignment of installing a gas cleaning device in a plant of the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company at Crystal City, Missouri, a plant costing millions of dollars. The purpose of this installation was to remove the impurities from the gas so it could be burned without injuring the engines. This method of cleaning gas was new. It had been tried only once before and under different conditions. In my work at Crystal City, Missouri, unforeseen difficulties arose. It worked after a fashion, but not well enough to meet the guarantees we had made. I was stunned by my failure. It was almost as if someone had struck me a blow on the head. My stomach, my insides began to twist and turn. For a while, I was so worried I couldn't sleep. Finally, common sense reminded me that worry wasn't getting me anywhere, so I figured out a way to handle my problem without worrying. It worked superbly. I've been using this same anti-worry technique for more than 30 years. It is simple. Anyone can use it. It consists of three steps. Step one. I analyzed the situation fearlessly and honestly and figured out what was the worst that could possibly happen as a result of this failure. No one was going to jail me or shoot me, that was certain. True, there was also a chance that I would lose my position, and there was also a chance that my employers would have to remove the machinery and lose the $20,000 we had invested. Step two. After figuring out what was the worst that could possibly happen, I reconciled myself to accepting it, if necessary. I said to myself, this failure will be a blow to my record, and it might possibly mean the loss of my job. But if it does, I can always get another position. Conditions could be much worse, and as far as my employers are concerned, well, they realize that we are experimenting with a new method of cleaning gas, and if this experience costs them $20,000, they can charge it up to research, for it's an experiment. After discovering the worst that could possibly happen and reconciling myself to accepting it, if necessary, an extremely important thing happened. I immediately relaxed and felt a sense of peace that I hadn't experienced in days. Step three. From that moment on, I calmly devoted my time and energy to trying to improve upon the worst which I had already accepted mentally. I now tried to figure out ways and means by which I might reduce the loss of $20,000 that we faced. I made several tests and finally figured out that if we spent another $5,000 for additional equipment, our problem would be solved. We did this, and instead of the firm losing $20,000, we made $15,000. I probably would never have been able to do this if I had kept on worrying because one of the worst features about worrying is that it destroys our ability to concentrate. When we worry, our minds jump here and there and everywhere, and we lose all power of decision. However, when we force ourselves to face the worst and accept it mentally, we then eliminate all these vague imaginings and put ourselves in a position in which we are able to concentrate on our problem. Now, this incident that I have related occurred many years ago, it worked so superbly that I've been using it ever since. And as a result, my life has been almost completely free from worry. Now, why is Willis H. Carrier's magic formula so valuable and so practical, psychologically speaking? Because it yanks us down out of the great gray clouds in which we fumble about when we're blinded by worry. It plants our feet good and solid on the earth. 
we know where we stand. And if we haven't solid ground under us, how in creation can we ever hope to think anything through? Professor William James, the father of applied psychology, has been dead since 1910. But if he were alive today and could hear this formula for facing the worst, he would heartily approve it. How do I know that? Because he told his own students, be willing to have it so, be willing to have it so, he said, because acceptance of what has happened is the first step in overcoming the consequences of any misfortune. Would you like to see how someone adopted Willis H. Carrier's magic formula and applied it to his own problem? Well, here's one example from a New York oil dealer who was a student in my classes. I was being blackmailed, this student began. I didn't believe it was possible. I didn't believe it could happen outside of the movies, but I was actually being blackmailed. What happened was this. The oil company, of which I was the head, had a number of delivery trucks and a number of drivers. At that time, war regulations were strictly in force, and we were rationed on the amount of oil we could deliver to any one of our customers. I didn't know it, but it seems that certain of our drivers had been delivering oil short to our regular customers and then reselling the surplus to customers of their own. The first inkling I had of these illegitimate transactions was when a man who claimed to be a government inspector came to see me one day and demanded hush money. He had got documentary proof of what our drivers had been doing, and he threatened to turn this proof over to the district attorney's office if I didn't cough up. I knew, of course, that I had nothing to worry about, personally at least, but I also knew that the law says a firm is responsible for the actions of its employees. What's more, I knew that if the case came to court and it was aired in the newspapers, the bad publicity would ruin my business. And I was proud of my business. It had been founded by my father 24 years before. I was so worried I was sick. I didn't eat or sleep for three days and nights. I kept going around in crazy circles. Should I pay the money, $5,000, or should I tell this man to go ahead and do his damnedest? Either way, I tried to make up my mind. It ended in a nightmare. Then on Sunday night, I happened to pick up the booklet on how to stop worrying, which I had been given in my Carnegie class in public speaking. I started to read it and came across the story of Willis H. Carrier, Face the worst, it said. So I asked myself, what's the worst that could happen if I refuse to pay up and these blackmailers turn their records over to the district attorney? The answer to that was the ruin of my business. That's the worst that can happen. I can't go to jail. All that can happen is that I shall be ruined by the publicity. I then said to myself, all right, the business is ruined. I accept that mentally. What happens next? Well, with my business ruined, I would probably have to look for a job. That wasn't bad. I knew a lot about oil. There were several firms that might be glad to employ me. I began to feel better. The blue funk I had been in for three days and nights began to lift a little. My emotions calmed down, and to my astonishment, I was able to think. I was clear-headed enough now to face step three, improve on the worst. As I thought of solutions, an entirely new angle presented itself to me. If I told my attorney the whole situation, he might find a way out which I hadn't thought of. I know it sounds stupid to say that this hadn't even occurred to me before, but of course I hadn't been thinking. I had only been worrying. I immediately made up my mind that I would see my attorney first thing in the morning, and then I went to bed and slept like a log. How did it end? Well, the next morning, my lawyer told me to go and see the district attorney and tell him the truth. I did precisely that. When I finished, I was astonished to hear the DA say that this blackmail racket had been going on for months and that the man who claimed to be a government agent was a crook wanted by the police. What a relief to hear all this after I had tormented myself for three days and nights wondering whether I should hand over $5,000 to this professional swindler. This experience taught me a lasting lesson. Now, whenever I face a pressing problem that threatens to worry me, I give it what I call the old Willis H. Carrier formula. If you think Willis H. Carrier had troubles, listen, you ain't heard nothing yet. Here's the story of Earl P. Haney of Winchester, Massachusetts. 
Here's the story as he told it to me himself on November 17, 1948, in the Hotel Statler in Boston. Back in the 20s, he said, I was so worried that ulcers began eating the lining of my stomach. One night I had a terrible hemorrhage. I was rushed to a hospital connected with the School of Medicine of Northwestern University of Chicago. My weight dropped from 175 pounds to 90 pounds. I was so ill, I was warned not even to lift my hand. Three doctors, including a celebrated ulcer specialist, said my case was incurable. I lived on alkaline powders and a tablespoonful of half milk and half cream every hour. A nurse put a rubber tube down into my stomach every night and morning and pumped out the contents. This went on for months. Finally, I said to myself, Look here, Earl Haney, if you have nothing to look forward to except a lingering death, you might as well make the most of the little time you have left. You have always wanted to travel around the world before you die, so if you're ever going to do it, you'll have to do it now. When I told my physicians I was going to travel around the world and pump out my own stomach twice a day, they were shocked. Impossible. They'd never heard of such a thing. They warned me that if I started around the world, I would be buried at sea. No, I won't, I replied. I have promised my relative that I will be buried in the family plot in Broken Bow, Nebraska, so I'm going to take my casket with me. I arranged for a casket, put it aboard a ship, and then made arrangements with the steamship company in the event of my death to put my corpse in a freezing compartment and keep it there till the liner returned home. I set out on my trip imbued with the spirit of old Omar. Ah, make the most of what we yet may spend before we too into the dust descend. Dust into dust and under dust to lie, sans wine, sans song, sans singer, and sans end. The moment I boarded the SS President Adams in Los Angeles and headed for the Orient, I felt better. I gradually gave up my alkaline powders and my stomach pump. I was soon eating all kinds of food, even strange native mixtures and concoctions that were guaranteed to kill me. As the weeks went by, I even smoked long black cigars and drank highballs. I enjoyed myself more than I had in years. We ran into monsoons and typhoons, which should have put me in my casket, if only from fright, but I got an enormous kick out of all this adventure. I played games aboard the ship, sang songs, made new friends, stayed up half the night. When we reached China and India, I realized that the business cares that I had faced back home were paradise compared to the poverty and hunger in the Orient. I stopped all my senseless worrying and felt fine. When I got back to America, I had gained 90 pounds and had almost forgotten I even had a stomach ulcer. I had never felt better in my life. I went back to business and haven't been ill a day since. Earl P. Haney told me he realizes now that he was unconsciously using the self-same principles that Willis H. Carrier used to conquer worry. First, I asked myself, what is the worst that could possibly happen? And the answer was death. Second, I prepared myself to accept death. I had to. There was no choice. The doctors said my case was hopeless. Third, I tried to improve the situation by getting the utmost enjoyment out of life for the short time I had left. If, he continued, if I had gone on worrying after boarding that ship, I have no doubt that I would have made the return voyage inside my coffin. But I relaxed. I forgot all my troubles. And this calmness of mind gave me a new burst of energy which actually saved my life. So, rule two is this. If you have a worry problem, apply the magic formula of Willis H. Carrier by doing these three things. One, ask yourself, what is the worst that can possibly happen? Two, prepare to accept it if you have to. Three, then calmly proceed to improve on the worst. Chapter three. What worry may do to you? 
Those who do not know how to fight worry die young, Dr. Alexis Carroll. Many years ago, a neighbor rang my doorbell one evening and urged me and my family to be vaccinated against smallpox. He was only one of thousands of volunteers who were ringing doorbells all over New York City. Frightened people stood in lines for hours at a time to be vaccinated. Vaccination stations were opened not only in all hospitals, but also in firehouses, police precincts, and in large industrial plants. More than 2,000 doctors and nurses worked feverishly day and night vaccinating crowds. The cause of all this excitement? Eight people in New York City had smallpox, and two had died. Two deaths out of a population of almost 8 million. Now, I had lived in New York for many, many years, and no one had ever yet rung my doorbell to warn me against the emotional sickness of worry, an illness that during the same period had caused 10,000 times more damage than smallpox. No doorbell ringer has ever warned me that one person out of 10 now living in these United States will have a nervous breakdown, induced in the vast majority of cases by worry, and emotional conflicts. So I'm writing this chapter to ring your doorbell and warn you. The great Nobel Prize winner in medicine, Dr. Alexis Carroll, said, Businessmen who do not know how to fight worry die young. And so do housewives and horse doctors and bricklayers. A few years ago, I spent my vacation motoring through Texas and New Mexico with Dr. O.F. Gober, one of the medical executives of the Santa Fe Railway. His exact title was Chief Physician of the Gulf, Colorado, and Santa Fe Hospital Association. We got to talking about the effects of worry, and he said 70% of all patients who come to physicians could cure themselves if they only got rid of their fears and worries. Don't think for a moment that I mean their ills are imaginary, he said. Their ills are as real as a throbbing toothache, and sometimes a hundred times more serious. I refer to such illnesses as nervous indigestion, some stomach ulcers, heart disturbances, insomnia, some headaches, and some types of paralysis. These illnesses are real. I know what I'm talking about, said Dr. Gober, for I suffered from a stomach ulcer for 12 years. Fear causes worry. Worry makes you tense and nervous and affects the nerves of your stomach and actually changes the gastric juices of your stomach from normal to abnormal and often leads to stomach ulcers. Dr. Joseph F. Montague, author of the book Nervous Stomach Trouble, says much the same thing. He says, you do not get stomach ulcers from what you eat. You get ulcers from what is eating you. Dr. W.C. Alvarez of the Mayo Clinic says, Ulcers frequently flare up or subside according to the hills and valleys of emotional stress. That statement was backed up by a study of 15,000 patients treated for stomach disorders at the Mayo Clinic. Four out of five had no physical basis whatever for their stomach illnesses. Fear, worry, hate supreme selfishness, and the inability to adjust themselves to the world of reality. These were largely the causes of their stomach illnesses and stomach ulcers. Stomach ulcers can kill you. According to Life magazine, they now stand tenth in our list of fatal diseases. I recently had some correspondence with Dr. Harold C. Habine of the Mayo Clinic. He read a paper at the annual meeting of the American Association of Industrial Physicians and Surgeons, saying he had made a study of 176 business executives whose average age was 44.3 years. He reported that slightly more than a third of these executives suffered from one of three ailments peculiar to high-tension living, heart disease, digestive tract ulcers, and high blood pressure. Think of it. A third of our business executives are wrecking their bodies with heart disease, ulcers, and high blood pressure before they even reach 45. What price success? And they aren't even buying success. Can any man possibly be a success who's paying for business advancement with stomach ulcers and heart trouble? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his health? 
Even if he owned the whole world, he could sleep in only one bed at a time and eat only three meals a day. Even a new employee can do that and probably sleep more soundly and enjoy his food more than a high-powered executive. Frankly, I would rather be a carefree person with no responsibility than wreck my health at 45 by trying to run a railroad or a cigarette company. The best-known cigarette manufacturer in the world dropped dead from heart failure while trying to take a little recreation in the Canadian woods. He amassed millions and fell dead at 61. He probably traded years of his life for what is called business success. In my estimation, this cigarette executive with all his millions was not half as successful as my father, a Missouri farmer who died at 89 without a dollar. The famous Mayo brothers declare that more than half our hospital beds are occupied by people with nervous troubles. Yet when the nerves of these people are studied under a high-powered microscope in a post-mortem examination, their nerves, in most cases, are apparently as healthy as the nerves of Jack Dempsey. Their nervous troubles are caused not by a physical deterioration of the nerves, but by emotions of futility, frustration, anxiety, worry, fear, defeat, despair. Plato said that the greatest mistake physicians make is that they attempt to cure the body without attempting to cure the mind. Yet the mind and body are one and should not be treated separately. It took medical science 2,300 years to recognize this great truth. We're just now beginning to develop a new kind of medicine called psychosomatic medicine, a medicine that treats both the mind and the body. It is high time we are doing that, for medical science has largely wiped out the terrible diseases caused by physical germs, diseases such as smallpox, cholera, yellow fever, and scores of other scourges that swept untold millions into untimely graves. But medical science has been unable to cope with the mental and physical wrecks caused not by germs, but by emotions of worry, fear, hate, frustration, and despair. Casualties caused by these emotional diseases are mounting and spreading with catastrophic rapidity. One out of every six of our young men called up by the draft in the Second World War was rejected for psychiatric reasons. What causes insanity? No one knows all the answers, but it's highly probable that in many cases fear and worry are contributing factors. The anxious and harassed individual who's unable to cope with the harsh world of reality breaks off all contact with his environment and retreats into a private dream world of his own making, and this solves his worry problems. I have on my desk a book by Dr. Edward Podolsky entitled Stop Worrying and Get Well. Here are some of the chapter titles in that book. What Worry Does to the Heart. High blood pressure is fed by worry. Rheumatism can be caused by worry. Worry less for your stomach's sake. How worry can cause a cold. Worry and the thyroid. The worrying diabetic. Another illuminating book about worry is Man Against Himself by Dr. Carl Menninger, one of the Mayo Brothers of Psychiatry. Dr. Menninger's book will not give you any rules about how to avoid worry, but it will give you a startling revelation of how we destroy our bodies and minds by anxiety, frustration, hatred, resentment, rebellion, and fear. You'll probably find a copy in your public library. Worry can make even the most stolid person ill. General Grant discovered that during the closing days of the Civil War. The story goes like this. Grant had been besieging Richmond for nine months. General Lee's troops, ragged and hungry, were beaten. Entire regiments were deserting at a time. Others were holding prayer meetings in their tents, shouting, weeping, and seeing visions. The end was close. Lee's men set fire to the cotton and tobacco warehouses in Richmond, burned the arsenal, and fled from the city at night while towering flames roared up into the darkness. Grant was in hot pursuit, banging away at the Confederates from both sides and the rear, while Sheridan's cavalry was heading them off in front, tearing up railway lines and capturing supply trains. 
Grant, half blind with a violent sick headache, fell behind his army and stopped at a farmhouse. I spent the night, he records in his memoirs, in bathing my feet in hot water and mustard and putting mustard plasters on my wrists and on the back part of my neck, hoping to be cured by morning. The next morning, he was cured instantaneously, and the thing that cured him was not a mustard plaster, but a horseman galloping down the road with a letter from Lee saying he wanted to surrender. When the officer bearing the message reached me, Grant wrote, I was still suffering with a sick headache, but the instant I saw the contents of the note, I was cured. Obviously, it was Grant's worries, tensions, and emotions that made him ill. He was cured instantly, the moment his emotions took on the hue of confidence, achievement, and victory. Seventy years later, Henry Morgenthau, Jr., Secretary of the Treasury in Franklin D. Roosevelt's cabinet, discovered that worry could make him so ill that he was dizzy. He records in his diary that he was terribly worried when the president, in order to raise the price of wheat, bought 4,400,000 bushels in one day. He says in his diary, I felt literally dizzy while the thing was going on. I went home and went to bed for two hours after lunch. If I want to see what worry does to people, I don't have to go to a library or a physician. I can look out of the window of my home where I'm writing this book, and I can see within one block one house where worry caused nervous breakdown, and another house where a man worried himself into diabetes. When the stock market went down, the sugar in his blood and urine went up. When Montaigne, the illustrious French philosopher, was elected mayor of his hometown, Bordeaux, he said to his fellow citizens, I am willing to take your affairs into my hands, but not into my liver and lungs. This neighbor of mine took the affairs of the stock market into his bloodstream and almost killed himself. If I want to be reminded of what worry does to people, I don't need to look at my neighbor's houses. I can look at this very room where I'm writing now and be reminded that a former owner of this house worried himself into an untimely grave. Worry can put you into a wheelchair with rheumatism and arthritis. Dr. Russell L. Cecil, a world-recognized authority on arthritis, has listed four of the commonest conditions that bring on arthritis. One, marital shipwreck. Two, financial disaster and grief. Three, loneliness and worry. Four, long-cherished resentments. And naturally, these four emotional situations are far from being the only causes of arthritis. There are many different kinds of arthritis due to various causes. But to repeat, the commonest conditions that bring on arthritis are the four listed by Dr. Russell L. Cecil. For example, a friend of mine was hard hit during the Depression that the gas company shut off the gas and the bank foreclosed the mortgage on his house. His wife suddenly had a painful attack of arthritis, and in spite of medicine and diets, the arthritis continued until their financial situation improved. Worry can even cause tooth decay. Dr. William I. L. McGonigal said in an address before the American Dental Association that unpleasant emotions, such as those caused by worry, fear, nagging, may upset the body's calcium balance and cause tooth decay. Dr. McGonagall told of a patient of his who had always had a perfect set of teeth until he began to worry over his wife's sudden illness. During the three weeks she was in the hospital, he developed nine cavities, cavities brought on by worry. Have you ever seen a person with an acutely overactive thyroid? I have, and I can tell you they tremble. They shake, they look like something half scared to death, and that's about what it amounts to. The thyroid gland, the gland that regulates the body, has been thrown out of kilter. It speeds up the heart. The whole body is roaring away at full blast like a furnace with all of its drafts wide open. And if this isn't checked, by operation or treatment, the victim may die, may burn himself out. Some time ago, I went to Philadelphia with a friend of mine who suffered from this condition. We consulted Dr. Israel Bram, a famous specialist who's been treating this type of ailment for 38 years. Here's the advice he had hanging on the wall of his waiting room, painted on a large wooden sign. I copied it down on the back of an envelope while I was waiting. Relaxation and recreation. The most relaxing recreating forces are a healthy religion, sleep, music, and laughter. 
Have faith in God, learn to sleep well, love good music, see the funny side of life, and health and happiness will be yours. The first question he asked this friend of mine was, what emotional disturbances brought on this condition? He warned my friend that if he didn't stop worrying, he could get other complications, heart trouble, stomach ulcers, or diabetes. All of these diseases, said that eminent doctor, are cousins, first cousins. When I interviewed film star Merle Oberon, she told me she refused to worry because she knew that worry would destroy her chief asset on the motion picture screen, her good looks. When I first tried to break into the movie, she told me, I was worried and scared. I'd just come from India, and I didn't know anyone in London where I was trying to get a job. I saw a few producers, but none of them hired me, and the little money I had began to give out. For two weeks, I lived on nothing but crackers and water. I was not only worried now, I was hungry. I said to myself, maybe you're a fool. Maybe you'll never break into the movies. After all, you have no experience. You've never acted at all. What have you to offer but a rather pretty face? I went to the mirror, and when I looked in that mirror, I saw what worry was doing to my looks. I saw the lines it was forming. I saw the anxious expression. So I said to myself, you've got to stop this at once. You can't afford to worry. The only thing you have to offer at all is your looks, and worry will ruin them. Few things can age and sour a woman and destroy her looks as quickly as worry. Worry curdles the expression. It makes us clench our jaws and lines our faces with wrinkles. It forms a permanent scowl. It may turn the hair gray and in some cases even make it fall out. It can ruin the complexion. It can bring on all kinds of skin rashes, eruptions, and pimples. Heart disease is the number one killer in America today. During the Second World War, almost a third of a million men were killed in combat. But during the same period, heart disease killed two million civilians, and one million of those casualties were caused by the kind of heart disease that's brought on by worry and high-tension living. Yes, heart disease is one of the chief reasons why Dr. Alexis Carroll said, businessmen who do not know how to fight worry die young. The Lord may forgive us our sins, said William James, but the nervous system never does. Here's a startling and almost incredible fact. More Americans commit suicide each year than die from the five most common communicable diseases. Why? The answer is largely worry. When the cruel Chinese warlords wanted to torture their prisoners, they would tie their prisoners hand and foot and put them under a bag of water that constantly dripped, 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 day and night. These drops of water constantly falling on the head finally became like the sound of hammer blows and drove men insane. This same method of torture was used during the Spanish Inquisition and in German concentration camps under Hitler. Worry is like the constant drip, drip, drip of water, and the constant drip, drip, drip of worry often drives men to insanity and suicide. When I was a country lad in Missouri, I was half scared to death by listening to Billy Sunday describe the hellfires of the next world. But he never even mentioned the hellfires of physical agony that worriers may have to face here and now. For example, if you're a chronic worrier, you may be stricken someday with one of the most excruciating pains ever endured by man, angina pectoris. Do you love life? Do you want to live long and enjoy good health? Here's how you can do it. I am quoting Dr. Alexis Carroll again. He said, Those who keep the peace of their inner selves in the midst of the tumult of the modern city are immune from nervous diseases. Can you keep the peace of your inner self in the midst of the tumult of a modern city? If you're a normal person, the answer is yes. Emphatically, yes. Most of us are stronger than we realize. We have inner resources that we have probably never tapped. As Thoreau said in his immortal book, Walden, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. If one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Surely many of the readers of this book have as much willpower, 
and as many inner resources as has Olga K. Jarvie of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. She discovered that under the most tragic circumstances, she could banish worry. I firmly believe that you and I can also, if we apply the old, old truths discussed in this volume. Here is Olga K. Jarvie's story as she wrote it for me. Eight and a half years ago, I was condemned to die a slow, agonizing death of cancer. The best medical brains of the country, the Mayo brothers, confirmed the sentence. I was at a dead-end street. The ultimate gaped at me. I was young. I did not want to die. In my desperation, I phoned to my doctor at Kellogg and cried out to him the despair in my heart. Rather impatiently, he upbraided me. What's the matter, Olga? Haven't you any fight in you? Surely you will die if you keep on crying. Yes, the worst has overtaken you. Okay, face the facts. Quit worrying, and then do something about it. Right then and there, I took an oath, an oath so solemn that the nails sank deep into my flesh and cold chills ran down my spine. I am not going to worry. I'm not going to cry, and if there's anything to mind over matter, I am going to win. I am going to live. The usual amount of x-rays in such advanced cases was at that time ten and a half minutes a day for 30 days. They gave me x-rays for 14 and a half minutes a day for 49 days, and although my bones stuck out of my emaciated body like rocks on a barren hillside, and although my feet were like lead, I did not worry. Not once did I cry. I smiled. Yes, I actually forced myself to smile. I am not so idiotic as to imagine that merely smiling can cure cancer, but I do believe that a cheerful mental attitude helps the body fight disease. At any rate, I experienced one of the miracle cures of cancer. I have never been healthier than in the past few years, thanks to those challenging, fighting words. Face the facts. Quit worrying, then do something about it. I'm going to close this chapter by repeating its title, the words of Dr. Alexis Carroll. Those who do not know how to fight worry die young. The followers of the Prophet Muhammad often had verses from the Koran tattooed on their breasts. I would like to have the title of this chapter tattooed on the breast of every reader of this book. Those who do not know how to fight worry die young. Was Dr. Carroll speaking of you? Could be. Part one in a nutshell. Fundamental facts you should know about worry. Rule one. If you want to avoid worry, do what Sir William Osler did. Live in daytight compartments. Don't stew about the future. Just live each day until bedtime. Rule two. Next time trouble with a capital T backs you up in a corner, try the magic formula of Willis H. Carrier. A. Ask yourself, what's the worst that can possibly happen if I can't solve my problem? B. Prepare yourself mentally to accept the worst if necessary. C. Then calmly try to improve upon the worst, which you have already mentally agreed to accept. Rule 3. Remind yourself of the exorbitant price you can pay for worry in terms of your health. Those who do not know how to fight worry die young. Mm -hmm.